Income tax 2023-2024 items that are not income. Get ready and some coffee because we'll need to handle a little perspiration to do income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in publication 334. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com or tax guide for small business for individuals who use Schedule C tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expense expenses resulting in net income, here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income, noting that the sole proprietorship Schedule C rolls into line one income of the formula, which is funny because the Schedule C itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses, otherwise known as business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which rolls from the Schedule C to line one income of the equation, basically mirroring the first page of the Form 1040 that we see here, the Schedule C ultimately rolling into line number eight, additional income from Schedule 1. Here is the additional income and adjustments to income, the Schedule 1, Part number one, additional income, Schedule C, rolling into line three, business income or loss from the Schedule C. All right, let's take a look at items that are not income. So when we're thinking about our Schedule C, we're thinking about an income statement. It has an income section and expense section. One of the questions, of course, is what has to be included in income? Noting that for taxes, everything's flipped on its head. Income is bad. We would like to have income, but allow it to be excluded. Something that we don't have to include for taxes, lowering taxable income, lowering the amount of taxes. The other questions that come up are, if I do have to include it in income, where do I have to include it in income? Do we have to include it on the Schedule C, where it might be subject also not only to federal income taxes, but self-employment taxes, Social Security and Medicare, or possibly could I include it some other place where maybe it wouldn't be subject to the self-employment uh, tax and... Uh, we also know that certain types of income could have more favorable tax rates rather than the default ordinary income tax rates, such as, for example, long-term capital gains and the uh, qualified dividends. So those are some of the things that we're trying to keep in mind from the perspective of tax preparation. I would like to be able to exclude income if legally possible. I'd like to possibly not put it on the Schedule C if it could go somewhere else so I'm not subject to the self-employment tax. And if there's any way possible to get a more favorable tax rate than the ordinary income, that would be nice as well. Okay, so in some cases, uh, the property or money you receive is not income. So appreciation. We have increase in value of your property or not income until you realize the increase through a sale or other taxable disposition. So in other words, appreciation is kind of like the inverse of depreciation. When we buy property, plant, and equipment for the business, normally it goes down in value, at least when we're talking about things other than, say, a building. So if we talk about a forklift or any type of equipment, it's usually going to depreciate, go down in value. What we're going to have to do is put it on the books when we purchase it as an asset using then the depreciation rules to expense it in the form of depreciation over the useful life in accordance with the regulations provided by the tax code. 
But some property, mainly real estate, might actually go up in value just because of location, 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 most likely. So what if it appreciates in value? Well, you would think, well, do I have to include it in income as it goes up uh, in value? Normally, no. And the arguments for that, the rationale for that is that real estate, for example, is unique. So although you can estimate that it went up in value until you actually sell it, you have not what we call realized the gain and any kind of increase in value that you're estimating would be that just that an estimate you can get an appraisal appraisal but it would still just be an estimate until you sold it also if we were to tax the increase in the value of say real estate then th we might not have the money to actually pay off the tax because we would need to sell the real estate in order to get the money that we would realize in order to pay off the tax that happened because the real estate went up in value so typically if something goes up in value we're not going to get hit with the tax until we sell it, at which point we're going to take the sales price minus the adjusted basis, realizing the gain. And then we have that complicated calculation and question about whether that gain is capital gain, ordinary income gain, what's the deal with the depreciation and so on. So consignments, consignments of merchandise to others to sell for you are not sales. So the title of merchandise remains with you, the consigner, even after the consignee possesses uh, the merchandise. So in other words, usually if you have merchandise, you buy the merchandise and then you're gonna sell the merchandise and the completion of the sale is you giving the merchandise to someone else under an accrual basis. That would mean the work has been done at that point in time and you would then get paid. But what if you have a situation where you're going to give someone else the merchandise but they're not going to pay you until they sell the merchandise. Well, in that case, you haven't actually sold it to them. They're just acting kind of as your agent uh, in order to sell it and you're paying them a commission to make the sale. For example, if you were a painter, you paint things, you give the art to a museum or something like that or some kind of display place and they display it and hopefully sell it. They are holding on to the inventory and they're going to facilitate the sale, but it's not like they bought the inventory from you and are then selling it, making a gross profit, but rather the inventory is still owned by you, although it's being handled by the people that are going to sell it, and they're going to make it kind of like a commission on the sale. It would be the general idea. So in that case, it wouldn't be a sale when you gave the paintings to the museum or, what, or whoever the sale auction place or whatever. Therefore, if you ship goods on consignment, you have no profit or loss until the consignee sells the merchandise. Merchandise you have shipped out on consignment is included in your inventory until it is sold. So even though you're not holding on to the painting or whatever it is in your warehouse, it's still your inventory, although it's being handled by somebody else. Do not include merchandise you receive on consignment in your inventory. So if on the other hand, you're the auctioneer, you receive paintings from other people. You didn't buy the paintings in those cases. You're just handling them on their behalf and therefore you're gonna have to track and make sure you don't lose them or whatever, but they're not actually your inventory. So include your profit or commission on merchandise consigned to you in your income when you sell the merchandise or when you receive your profit or commission, depending on the method of accounting you use. So construction allowances. So if you enter into a lease after August 5th, 1997, you can exclude from income the construction allowance you received in cash or as a rent reduction from your landlord if you receive it under both the following conditions. Under a short-term lease or retail space for the purpose of constructing or improving qualified long-term real property for use in your business at that retail space. So the amount you can exclude, you can exclude the construction allowance to the extent it does not exceed the amount you spent for construction or improvements. All right, what we have a short term lease. So a short term lease is a lease or other agreement for occupancy or use of retail space for 15 years or less. 
So obviously, if you're a business, small businesses might be working out of their home. Larger businesses might be purchasing space that they're going to be working in or renting basically office space like in an office building, noting that office leases are much different oftentimes in terms of the, the, the period of lease terms and the structure of the lease than rental renting like a home or a place to live for example, oftentimes because the people that have a business want to lock down that space for longer periods of time. So, so you get these long leases. So in any case, a short-term lease then is a short-term lease is a lease or other agreement for occupancy or use of retail space for 15 years or less. So the following rules apply in determining whether the lease is for 15 years or less. So take into account options to renew when figuring whether the lease is for 15 years or less. So clearly, whenever they put in these kind of rules in terms of whether something uh, qualifies for short term or long term, you can imagine people trying to manipulate the contract so that in in it looks like it's a short term lease if that's what they're trying to do, even though in actuality, it's a long term lease, right? So you can put in clauses into the contract which will basically guarantee that the lease is kind of going to be longer than it otherwise than it would be, but you're trying to make it look like it's under 15 years so that you can qualify for a short-term lease. So, but do not take into account any option to renew at fair market value determined at the time of renewal. So two or more successive leases that are part of the same transaction or a series of related transactions for the same or substantially similar retail space are treated as one lease. Retail space. Retail space is real property least occupied or otherwise used by you as a tenant in your business of selling tangible personal property or services to the general public. Qualified long-term real property. So qualified long-term real property is non-residential. So residential, you're living in it. Non-residential, non-residential business property. Real property that is part of or otherwise present at your retail space and that reverts to the landlord when the lease ends. So exchange of like kind property. So here, this is another one we've touched on in prior presentation, but it's a big one when you get into like real estate transactions. Again, it's usually gonna be a specialized area. So if you dealing with certain types of real estate, then some people specialize exclusively or, or have a lot of business in the idea of these uh, like kind type of exchanges and how to qualify and make sure that qualifications have been met uh, with regards to them. So generally, if you exchange real property used for business or held uh, as an investment solely for other business or investment real property of a like kind, no gain or loss is recognized. Now you might get into again questions like why would this be the case? Uh, if we're if we're selling property and the, the general idea would be here, well, if I have a piece of property and I've depreciated it over time, if I were to sell it, especially if it's real estate, even though I depreciated it, it might not go and have de have gone down in value because much of the value of the property is based on basically location. So that means if I sell it, I'm going to trigger a gain. And that will dissuade people from wanting to sell the property because they don't want to have to realize the gain, which will be a significant uh, tax impact. So we want people to be able to sell property freely. So the idea would then be, well, if you exchange the property and qualify as an exchange, then you'll still be in, like in the same situation, but possibly you'll be able to go from one property to the other. And instead of recognizing the gain, we're going to take the basis of the old property, which is the lower basis, right? And basically kind of convert that to the basis of the new property. Now get this gets quite complicated because the two properties aren't the same. And and the people that are involved in the transaction are going to be different people involved in the transaction, typically, and most kind of these uh, types of exchanges. But that's the general idea. We want to be able to allow people to go from one piece of property to another piece of property and not be locked into one that would reduce transactions by saying you don't have to realize the gain as long as you're kind of in the same situation with the second piece of property and you have the same lower basis 
so that if you sold the property, you would recognize the gain at the lower basis, which would be a larger gain at the point of sale when you actually re would realize it. Okay. So this means that the gain is not taxable and the loss is not deductible. So for more information, you can see form 8824 on that one. You've got leasehold improvements. So if a tenant erects buildings or makes improvements to your property, the increase in the value of the property due to the improvements is not income to you. So you lease property, someone else is using the property and they make improvements on it. Now, if they made improvements on the property in exchange for rent, then then you would think that, that you'd have to include that as income because now they've or, or possibly in the value of the building if it was uh, 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 something that should be capitalized. But it, if it's their property and they have the ability to do whatever they want to the property and they're not doing it in exchange for the rent, then then that's on them to to improve you know, the property and possibly not going to be income to you because you didn't tell them to do the increase or the change for you in exchange for rent, for example. However, so if the facts indicate that the improvements are a payment of rent to you, then the increase in the value would be income. So in other words, if you if you gave someone an office building and and they can do basically a lot of things with an office building that you wouldn't really think. And like, if you're just used to like rental property of residential property, so they might like wipe out the whole floor on an office building and then put, and then put their own separations in it and, and whatnot, and make extensive changes to the office building that have nothing to do with the employer, right? They put the ping pong table in there and they, put a whole thing so the pool table fits so the stick doesn't hit the wall and everything and whatnot. But it has you didn't tell them to do that. So you would think that that wouldn't be something that you have to include in income, even if it was an increase in the value of the place. But if you told them that you to do that in exchange for rent, and then you didn't take the rent, you would think then it might be income. All right, loans. So money borrowed through a bona fide loan is uh, not income. So clearly, if you got a loan, the, then you got cash, but it's not income because on the balance sheet, which you wouldn't see on the Schedule C, you would increase the liability. You owe the money back. And then, on, and then you've got cash. Cash is also a balance sheet item. There's no income statement item in that transaction. It wouldn't be on the Schedule C, which is an income statement. If you took out a loan from the bank, cash goes up, but the other side doesn't go to revenue it goes to a liability loan payable, which you're gonna to have to pay back. So the thing that does hit the income statement on the loans is the interest in the form of an expense when you pay the loan off and are paying basically the rent on the purchasing power of the money, which is interest. Sales tax, state and local sales taxes imposed on the buyer, which uh, were, were required to collect and pay over the state or local governments uh, are not income.